Well, good morning. Uh, just a refresher. My name's Chandler. I'm a junior at Ozark Christian College. Uh, I am originally from Atlanta, Georgia, uh, and I now live uh, in Georgetown, Delaware. Uh, I'm so happy to be here. I love y'all so much. So I'm so <laughs> glad to be here today. And today I'm going to talk about freedom. Freedom is a concept that we love, uh, love to have and we hate to lose it. Uh, freedom is pers- per- oh, I can't talk today, I guess, personified in a lot of different ways. Uh, As Americans, when we think of freedom, a lot of times we think about the 4th of July. It's America's holiday. It's the day where we celebrate our freedom. Uh, We celebrate it so much that this past 4th of July, we spent $7.4 billion uh, on celebrating America's freedom. And that's a really general way of talking about freedom, but I, I think freedom is a little bit more specific. You see, when we think of freedom or things that are freeing to us, a lot of different things might come to mind. For me, when I think of freedom, I just get this picture in my head. I close my eyes and I can picture it right now. Uh, I live in Delaware. I live about 15 minutes from the Atlantic Ocean. So I'm right there at the beach. Um, There's a highway. It's called the Atlantic Highway. It runs parallel to the ocean. Um, And I just picture driving my dad's Jeep down the Atlantic Highway, top off, windows down, doors off. Uh, everything, just freeing, listening to Leonard Skinner. I mean, it's just the most freeing thing I can picture in my head. I'm driving down, down the ocean breeze is hitting my face. Uh, I just, I love it so much. It's so freeing. But maybe for you, uh, freedom is personified through playing an instrument uh, or singing. Maybe freedom uh, is personified through sitting down and watching your favorite TV show or movie. Maybe freedom is uh, personified by traveling to different states and sites, maybe going to different countries. I know I find a lot of freedom in doing that, and it's been really tough not being able to do that these past couple months. You see, freedom looks different for every individual, but one commonality remains. Nobody wants to lose their sense of freedom. Everybody wants to keep it. Once you have it, you never want to let it go. It's one way we all have a similarity in our freedom. But what happens when the freedom that we have is being taken away by something that feels more comfortable than the freedom itself? What if the thing that is trying to take away our freedom feels just comfortable? It feels right. In Scripture, we we see this take place, actually. We see a group of people, the Galatians, that they, they are in Christ. They have the freedom that Christ provides. But they're letting it go because of something that feels more comfortable. See, the Galatian church, a majority of them were Jewish Christians, which means before they became Christians, they followed the Jewish law. And these these Jewish Christians were being attacked by uh, these religious uh, Jewish people uh, and saying, hey, if we're going to we're going to open Christianity up to everybody, if you're a Jew, you're okay. Keep following the Jewish law and believe in Christ. But if you're a Gentile, you've got to become a Jew and then you can be a Christian. You see, the thing that was most comfortable to the Galatians, uh, the Jewish Galatians, was what was taking away their freedom. So Paul gets wind of this, and he's very upset. Uh, He he is quite angry, so he pins a letter. And this letter, the letter of Galatians, is defending the gospel freedom that Christ provides. So today, we're going to be looking at this freedom. So if you want to, you can go ahead and turn to Galatians 5 um, in your Bibles. And we're going to start in verse 1, where we see that everything in our Christian walk comes back to freedom. So Galatians 5, uh, starting in verse 1, says, It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then, and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. I'm going to read that one more time. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then, and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. Everything comes back to freedom. When we read verse 1, we see a summary of the past two chapters of the book where Paul is defending uh, the gospel freedom that we have. Actually, I I like how Tim Keller, he's a pastor in New York, um, famous writer. He's written a couple good books. He says, this verse represents how freedom is both the means and the end of the Christian life. 
Everything about the Christian gospel is about freedom. Jesus' mission was a mission of liberation. Jesus came to free me. He came to free you. He came to free us from the sin that resides in the world and even resides in our own self. Christ has set us free so that we do not have to worry about sin because Christ has freed us from our sin. He came not for himself, but for us. He was selfless. He did not come to free himself. He was already free. He's fully God and fully man. He came to free us. His act of obedience on the cross allows us to be free in the present day. Jesus shows us true leadership because he did not come for the enrichment of himself, but for the benefit of those who follow him. Jesus came not for his own, like, his own personal benefit. He came for the benefit of us. You see, we were dead. We were dead and gone. But Jesus came down and said, no, I'm going to free you from this. I'm going to make you alive again. Mother Teresa, does everybody know who Mother Teresa is? She was a famous uh, Catholic nun. Uh, she was attending uh, a party full of dignitaries. The guest list included presidents and statesmen from around the world. They came in their crowns and their jewels and their silks and their finest wardrobes and clothing and jewelry. But Mother Teresa just wore her, uh, her robes that she always wore, and it was held together with a simple safety pin. She was engaged in conversation with a nobleman who was intrigued by her work to the poorest of the poor in Calcutta, India. From his vantage point, her work just seemed endless and frustrating. There was no progress from what it seemed from his vantage point. He asked her if she didn't become uh, discouraged by seeing so few successes in her ministry. And this is what she had to say. No, I do not become discouraged. You see, God has not called me to a ministry of success. He has called me to a ministry of mercy. Christ came not for his own success, but for a ministry of mercy. He came to show us freedom. He came for the benefit of the world so that we can have freedom and nothing can change that. However, sometimes we still think that after we accept that freedom in Christ, that he gives us so graciously that we still have to work to be free. You know, Paul keeps writing about this to the Jewish Christians in, in Galatia. And so if we keep reading in Galatians 5, Paul gives us this message that we cannot add value to Christ. But when we try to add value to Christ, it only ends up subtracting value. So the next part of the text in Galatians, it reads, Mark my words. I, Paul, tell you that if you let yourselves be circumcised, circumcised, Christ will be of no value to you at all. Again, I declare to every man who lets himself be circumcised that he is obligated to obey the whole law. You who are trying to be justified by the law have been alienated from Christ. You have fallen away from grace. For though the Spirit we eagerly await by faith the righteousness for which we hope. Our freedom cannot, our freedom, freedom cannot be added to by our own doing. And I don't know about you, but this is really hard for me to hear. Uh, I think the last time that I was here, um, I believe it was Stephanie that asked this question. She said, hey, what's your biggest fear? And uh, most people, snakes, heights, whatever uh, it was. But me and Brandon, we looked at each other and we said, our biggest fear is failure. <laughs> um, and, and it's a big fear. But for me, my biggest fear being failure, it, uh, it, it means that if my biggest fear is failure, that means I'm always striving for success. Striving for success is not bad. It's a great thing. I highly recommend it. Always strive to pursue excellence. But when I am successful, it's really easy for me to build my worth on when people affirm my success. So I don't know what sometimes you think your worth comes from or where your freedom comes from. Maybe uh, sometimes you believe that your worth and your freedom comes from being the best instrument player, the smartest person in your classes or at your school. It doesn't. Maybe your worth comes from how well you perform at your job or how well you perform in high-pressure situations. It doesn't. Maybe you pull your worth and your freedom from how well you are 
uh, at parenting or how to be a husband or a wife or maybe how well of a friend you are. It doesn't. And I have to constantly preach this message to myself because that, none of my freedom comes from that. My freedom doesn't come from my own successes. It comes from Christ's success. We have to know that our worth and freedom does not come from our own righteousness, but Christ's righteousness that he lavished onto us. Nothing that we do will add any joy to our own life. All the joy, all the freedom, it all comes from Jesus. Jesus is the solution to our anguish, the solution to our sin. And like I said earlier, if we try to add on to it, it will only subtract from the gift of freedom that Christ provides for us. At verse 3, I'm going to go back a bit. Uh, Paul writes, I declare to every man who lets himself be circumcised that he is obligated to obey the whole law. Now a little context. There's 613 laws that Paul is referring to here. That's the Jewish law. And he's saying to the first century Jewish Christians, if you elevate the works of the law as to what gives you freedom, you have to follow the whole law. 613 laws. That's a lot of laws to follow and to fill you in on a little secret. It's impossible. <laughs> Nobody could follow the whole law. That's what Paul is saying. It's impossible to have freedom from your sin when you try and do it yourself. You need a Savior who can save you. You need someone who can provide that freedom for you. You can't do it on your own. I cannot do it on our own, on my own. Working for our freedom takes away from what we have to look forward to in Christ. Not only does it impact our, our vision in the present day, it impacts our vision in the future. You see verse 5, it says, For through the Spirit... We eagerly await by faith the righteousness for which we hope. When we try and work for our freedom, we take away the joys of our future where we can be welcomed by God into his arms. We take away the wiping away of our sinful record and having it replaced with a record saying, you are righteous. We take away the radiance and the glory and the perfection and the beauty that is awaiting for us when we just let go and let God. Our works that we try and fulfill ourselves with not only impact our present self, it impacts our future self and how we view ourselves. Uh, Patrick Henry, he was a famous uh, speech writer, orator, and a revolutionary politician in the 18th century uh, colonies. He once said this famous line, um, you probably know it, uh, if you don't, that's okay. It says, give me liberty or give me death. Now, the freedom that he wants is a, a little different. It's freedom for British rule, but he's so passionate about it that he would rather die than not be free. Now, in our acceptance of Christian freedom, uh, the choice is not a choice between whether we fight for our own freedom and, or die for it. The choice is whether we are going to accept the freedom giving, given to us or die fighting against it. So how do we live in freedom? We know that Christ came for our freedom. That was his purpose. We know that there's no point in fighting for our own freedom because it only takes away from the joys of Christ's freedom. So what do we do? Paul gives us an answer in verse 6. In verse 6, it reads... For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision has any value. The only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. Now I'm going to take us back to the greatest commandment. I'm going to sum it up simply. Love God and love people with the freedom that we have received. And the freedom we've received is not a passive freedom. It's an active freedom. Our command is not to live by works, but to live a faithful life. And from that faithfulness, love others around us. Like I said, it, it takes me back to the greatest commandment where, where Jesus says, the greatest commandment is to love God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength. And then he says to love your neighbor as yourself. The first thing is faith. 
We have to have faith in Christ first. It's, the, it's first for a reason. We can't uh, have outpouring of faith through love if we have no faith to begin with. The second thing, though, is that from that faith and the outpouring of our heart should be uh, love. It should manifest itself in the form of love to our neighbors. Our freedom is not passive and a bench warmer in our tool belt of gifts that Christ gives us, but is an active tool that we should use every day as the center piece of our faith and our love to those around us. Now get ready because I'm going to use another football illustration. Uh, I think of it like this. The, the Kansas City Chiefs have been blessed with the gift of Patrick Mahomes. <laughs> it would be silly for them to not use his gifts and his abilities to make an impact in their bubble, the NFL. Now, look, now looking back at us, it would be foolish for us to look at the gift of freedom and say it, it's not worthy to be used to, to impact the world around us. We have to use the freedom we have been given through our faith and from that, our love. Using freedom uh, for the good of those around may look different for each and every one of you. We're all in very unique situations, circumstances, and lives. But maybe it looks like having conversations and building relationships with people in your classes or your work so that roots for the gospel can be planted, so that people can have that freedom as well. Maybe it looks like reaching out to people who are not free, whether that be physically enslaved or spiritually enslaved to their own sin. I remember when I was little and, and I was kind of having a lot of doubts and questions, one of the biggest influences in my life that kind of pushed me closer to Christ and accepting Christ was seeing my mother's faithfulness. I was enslaved to my own sin, but seeing her freedom made me want to have that. We can pray for them and, and help them with their needs, introduce them to scripture, and again, help plant seeds that will break their spiritual bondage of sin, or maybe even help break them out of their physical enslavement. I actually had a really unique uh, story this summer. Uh, this summer, I had the opportunity to intern at Parkview Christian Church. It's in Orland Park, Illinois. It's about 40 minutes outside of Chicago. Um, and a few things about that area of the country, there's probably three things you need to know. The first one is uh, they're 90 to 95 percent Irish Catholic. Uh, so it's very, very heavily Catholic population. The second thing is that all of them are nominal, which means they don't really take their faith too seriously, or they're cultural, which means they just claim to be Catholic because that's what their parents were, or they grew up Catholic, and then once they moved out of the house, they just kind of stopped going to church. And the third thing is they spend a lot of time in bars. <laughs> um, they, they like to drink. And the church I was at, they recognized this, this tendency of the people that were around them. And they wanted to serve them. Uh, and, but they wanted to use their faith that they had in Jesus and love their community. So what did they do? They took the freedom they had in Christ and through their faith in him to, to work through them. And through the love they had in their heart, they started small groups inside of bars. <laughs> uh, they started bar ministry where those who are not followers of Jesus could feel comfortable to come and ask questions, sit down and pray, read scripture together. It was the first time I'd ever seen anything like this, a bar ministry. It was really, really cool, actually, to see. I, I saw people get baptized that were introduced to church and Jesus through the bar ministry. It's a beautiful depiction of the action that should flow from verse 6. When you're a little kid, when you're five or six, and you're given the best gift you've ever gotten on Christmas, I mean, think of it right now. The best gift you ever got Christmas morning. I can think of mine right now. I remember when I was eight, I got a Wii. I was so happy. <laughs> The first thing I did is I told everybody. The gift of freedom is a gift that we cannot keep to ourselves, but we have to give to those around us. We've been given freedom in many different ways. We have freedom as the fact that we're human beings. We have inalienable rights. We have been given freedom by the fact that we're Americans. Some of us have even been given more freedoms because of how old we are or where we work 
what we do for a living. However, all those freedoms are simply just constructs of the world we live in. They pale in comparison to the freedom that Christ has given us. And I want to I take us back to this picture of, of the freedom that Christ gives us. The radiance and the glory and the beauty and the perfection of that freedom. It's a beautiful image. Our Christ-centered freedom is forever while the freedom of this world is temporary. Not only that, our Christ-given freedom can never be taken away from us. It was given to us with no cost, at, no cost to us, but all cost to Jesus. The only freedom that can fulfill us is freedom that is built on Jesus. Nothing else will do the trick. Nothing else will satisfy us. Our works won't satisfy us. Our attempts to be worthy won't satisfy us. The affirmations that people give us will not ultimately satisfy us. But only freedom that Christ gives us will fulfill the aching and the groaning of our hearts for something more in this world. We have to build our freedom on freedom that is built in Christ. Let me pray. Lord, we thank you for today, and we thank you that you have given us freedom that you came on a mission of liberation. Lord, we thank you that we can live in that freedom and that we can have faith in that freedom and that from that faith we can go out and love those around us. Lord, help us to love and help us to live in that freedom and, and share that gift. Lord, we love you. It's your son's name we pray. Amen.